seven. He is a regular columnist with the newspaper as public, and I understand some other um, newspapers as well. And what Owen is going to speak to us this morning about is Liam Meadows and the history of left republicanism in Ireland. So I'd ask you to um, make Owen very welcome. Thank you. here rather than up there, it's a little bit less uh, intimidating for me. But first of all, thank you very much. Um, you're all either incredibly dedicated or you're being punished for doing something very bad yesterday, <laughs> having to come in and listen to me uh, at 10 o'clock uh, on a Saturday morning. But I suppose what I'd like to try and do is, is kind of raise some questions about Liam Mellows uh, and the impact that Liam Mellows' thinking, and particularly the writing at the end of his life, <laughs> has had not just on the history of left republicanism but on, on our project currently. So I suppose let me start by throwing out a, a controversial statement which is having spent a lot of time reading about Liam Mellows, kind of listening to other people talk about him, I'm actually in two minds about him um, uh, in some respects. And what I mean by that is on the one hand Liam Mellows as everybody knows is a great republican. Uh, as a member of the IRB, the FIANA, an Irish volunteer, his role, particularly his leadership role as an organiser uh, in the run-up to 1916, uh, the rising in Galway itself, uh, somebody who spent a period of time in prison, uh, both in, in Ireland and in the US, his role in the Civil War and ultimately his execution. So people know the history of, of Liam Mellows, the man, and the contribution that he made to our struggle. But actually, what he's much more important for is the ideological legacy that he left uh, for modern republicanism. And while that's hugely important, uh, and it's one of the foundations, I suppose, of who we are today, there are also a lot of unresolved tensions in his writings and his thinking and, uh, and in that legacy that he has left us. And in some senses, <coughs> part of the difficulty for Republicans throughout the 20th and 21st century is that we never manage to fully resolve those tensions that are within his writings. And really that's what I'd like to, to talk about today. And despite the fact that he wrote very little, the really important things that he wrote through his Mount Joe Jail notes, which are you know, only a few hundred words long, and a few uh, articles published shortly after his death uh, in the Voice of Labour uh, paper, he had a huge impact, first of all, on that generation of left Republicans of Pat O'Donnell and Michael Price and George Gilmore, but also, and probably more importantly for us, an enormous influence on Gerry Adams and that generation of Republican leaders that emerged, uh, particularly uh, from Long Kesh uh, in the 1970s. And in the introduction that Jerry wrote to the most recent publication of uh, Desmond Greaves' book, Jerry describes uh, Mellows as one of the most radical and intellectually questioning of the 1916 to 1922 Republican leaders. And then Jerry goes on to say in the next page <coughs> that the great pity is that he, Liam Mellows, didn't write more and that the political class and strategic view which underpins those notes, the Mantra notes, which I'll talk about in a moment, were not a widespread part of the Republican program uh, of that period. Uh, and in fact, I have a strong view, um, and maybe other people might not agree, but Liam Mellows is probably more important than any other of the, period, the, the Republican figures during that period in kind of shaping the way in which modern left Republicans think uh, about uh, our own uh, project. And even though some people would argue that James Connolly is a much more significant figure in terms of the depth of his writings, and I certainly agree with that, Connolly was kind of part in and part out of the Republican movement. Uh, and we need to be honest with ourselves about that. Where Liam Mellows was at the very heart of the Republican movement. And because of that, even though his writings, I think, are less interesting or less significant than Connolly's, I think they've had a much bigger influence uh, uh, over the course of our history. It's also important to understand that when we talk about Mellows and our understanding of Mellows, it, it is mediated through, in particular, uh, Desmond Greaves' work. And I mean that there's no criticism of, of the work at all, but it's important that we understand how that kind of shapes our, our thinking. And the, the biography, and, and those that haven't read it, I have to say, I, I can't recommend the book enough. Uh, it's a really, really fantastic read, and people uh, they should read it. But Desmond Green wasn't a neutral observer. He wasn't an academic historian. He was a political activist. Uh, and that's, again, in no way to disparage the quality uh, of his writing. And the writing of this biography just like his writing of the biography of Connolly, was a political act, and it was intended to achieve very specific, in my view, political purposes. For those of you, and I'm sure most of you know this, but 
Desmond Greaves was one of the founders of the Common Association, an organisation explicitly set up uh, uh, to help mobilise and, and radicalise the Irish diaspora living in Britain. Um, it was part of a broader strategy that, that uh, communist parties, in this case the Communist Party of Great Britain, had for engaging with migrant communities in countries such as Britain. And similar approaches were taken in the US and elsewhere. And it was also part of that view among, I suppose, the common turn in the international communist movement that uh, the, the best way to try and engage and influence and, and, and have a bearing to, uh, on Irish politics more generally was actually through republicanism. It was actually through the national liberation movements rather than necessarily uh, independent, standalone communist parties uh, here, often actually to the discomfort uh, of those people who were directly involved in the communist movement uh, in Ireland. And in that sense, Greaves is, is decision to write the book about Mellis is very important because what Greaves is, is doing, I suppose, is two things. He's picking a figure who very clearly at the end of his political career tried very consciously to kind of fuse the national aspirations of the Republican movement for uh, political independence with the social uh, uh, objectives of creating a democratic socialist uh, 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 Ireland or an Ireland of equals, uh, as some people call it today. Uh, and that, I suppose, foregrounding or that emphasising of the national and the social and how they interrelate uh, in Mellows' thinking is very important to Greaves. But it's also important that Greaves, because of the particular uh, approach he took to revolutions generally, but also the Irish Revolution, there was very much this idea of a kind of stages <coughs> of the Irish Revolution. That what you had to have in the first instance was the national revolution, ending imperialism, creating uh, a national democracy, and then, uh, following on from that, you would then have the kind of social economic revolution, the overthrow of capitalism, uh, and the creation of a different socio-economic order. And that particular way of thinking, whether you agree with it or not, has been hugely influential, mediated through Desmond Greaves, but into uh, the leadership uh, of, I suppose, 20th century republicanism uh, uh, through uh, uh, Jerry and other figures, uh, and again has had a very big bearing on how we see the work that we do uh, ourselves. <laughs> Just to talk then, I suppose, about the, the jail notes. And again, I remember when I first came across these things, I thought these jail notes must be this big document and they must have you know, huge depth and lots of information. Like they're, they're really, really short kind of observations that Mellows uh, wrote in the final months of his life uh, while in jail awaiting uh, ultimately execution in December 1922. And in some senses, I suppose, it's, it's Mellows reflecting and trying to come to terms with the failure of the bit of the project that he was involved in at that time. Right? So the national independence movement has fragmented around the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Uh, the radicals who oppose the treaty uh, 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 are in the process of being defeated. He's in jail. Uh, and they're trying to come to grips with, with that particular, I suppose, crisis. In, in their own political project, and like anybody who's trying to deal with a crisis, they're trying to find ways of both understanding it, but also trying to overcome it, to come up with uh, propositions and suggestions uh, for how to get out of the difficulty that they're in. Uh, and the notes themselves, I suppose they have three key planks, three key uh, uh, arguments that are, are particularly important. The first is, Mellows is making a really, really strong argument uh, for a, a Republican working class alliance that rather than, as had been the case in the mainstream of the independence movement, seeing it as it was a cross-class uh, uh, alliance of all sections of Irish society, what Mellows is arguing is, is actually that's not uh, uh, what's going to work. That was part of the problem uh, uh, in the run-up to the Anglo-Irish Treaty and the of the Civil War. So what you needed was the Republican movement to see that its social base uh, were working people. Uh, were working class people, were agricultural <coughs> labourers, were those people who weren't benefiting from the socio-economic order pre or post uh, partition. But also he makes a very explicit plea uh, <coughs> in terms of an alliance with Irish labour. And Irish labour not just in terms of working class people, but Irish labour in terms of the institutions uh, of, of the trade union movement and I presume of the Labour Party itself or that constituency that they represent. The second thing that he then does, I suppose, is to hark back to or emphasise the democratic programme. So that not just does the Republican movement to get out of the impasse that it's in in 1922 
need to have this working class alliance and this alliance with Labour, but it needs to get back to the core kind of radical policy proposals contained in the 1990 democratic programme. And he emphasises in particular nationalisation of industries, the transport of banks, uh, and the redistribution of, of uh, land uh, repossessed uh, from large rancher fam farmers and, and landlords. And then the third, and this was probably more clear in an article that Mellows had published after his death, but I presume he wrote it sometime uh, around the same time as, as the, uh, the notes in Mount Joy. But in a, in a particular article that was published in December of 1922 in The Voice of Labour, he argues very, very explicitly uh, that the Irish Revolution isn't just a political revolution. It's not just about replacing the British administration with an Irish administration, but it is explicitly about replacing the socio-economic order uh, that existed uh, uh, during the period uh, of British rule uh, and that was continuing uh, post-Anglo-Irish uh, Treaty with a new economic order. And I'll come to some of the quotes on that uh, in, in a moment. That's a really big shift away from the kind of mainstream of where the independence movement and the republican movement were at in the years that Mellows was a, a volunteer and an organiser and, and a political uh, leader. Um, and I just want to read out a couple of the sections. I mean, I'm sure most people here have probably read these, but I just think they're worth uh, uh, emphasising. For me, there's three bits of these writings that are really important. The first one, and this deals with this issue of, of the kind of, you know, who you're allied to who your, your social base is, who you're looking for support for. And what Bello says is, in our efforts to win back public support to the Republic, we are forced to recognise, whether we like it or not, that the commercial interest, so-called, money and the Gombean men are on the side of the treaty, because the treaty means imperialism in England. We are back to tone, Bello says, and it is just all, it is just as well, relying on the great body, the men of no property, the stake in the country people were never with the Republic. They are not with it now, and they will always be against it until it wins. And very kind of powerful and, and, and strong stuff. On the democratic programme, and, and again it's important because the democratic programme is again a short document, but has a, a range of different things. But what Mellows emphasises is the democratic programme control, the social programme adopted by the Dáil, coinciding to Declaration of Independence, January 19, should be translated into something definite. So they need to take the principles of that important document but translate it into meaningful uh, policy. This is essential that the great body of workers are to be kept on the side of independence. This does not require a change of outlook, says Mellows, on the part of Republicans, or the adoption of a revolutionary programme as such. And then he goes into list the key issues, and again, nationalisation of industries, of transport, canals, railways, banks, and redistribution of land. But then, probably the most explicit one, <coughs> And I want to quote this one just uh, from the, the uh, Voice of Labour article. I can just call it up. Is where he talks about uh, something much more than the political revolution. And he says, Ireland does not want a change of masters. Uh, it would be foolish, surely, to free Ireland from foreign tyranny today and less than 20 years hence to have it to free it from domestic tyranny. Therefore, the Irish Republic must have for its foundation uh, the people. And then he goes on to say, if I can find the correct quote, the revolution going on in Ireland has a threefold aspect. It is intellectual, it is political, it is e economic. Of the intellectual aspect, it is sufficient here to say that Ireland to be free must be Irish must be as free from the dominion of alien thought as from alien armies of occupation. The end of political struggle, the withdrawal of the British Army and British officials from Ireland, and the international recognition of the Irish Republic, will be the means of solving many of the present economic and social problems there, enabling the government of Ireland to devote its entire attention to the internal matters of the country. Industries will receive encouragement, employment will increase, the natural resources of the country tapped, emigration stopped, education put on its proper basis, and direct contact with the outside world established. But then he goes on to say, yet all of this, resulting out of wood in the country being richer and more prosperous, would not mean that the freedom of Ireland has been attained if the economic system remains unchanged. A political revolution in Ireland without a coincident economic revolution simply means a change of masters. Instead of British capitalists waxing rich 
under political and economic enslavement of Ireland as at present, we would have Irish capitalists waxing rich on the political freedom of continued enslavement of Ireland. Uh, and then it uh, goes on. Now, for me, the significance of all of this, I suppose, rests in two things. First thing is, and again when you read Jerry's introduction to the book, he talks about when he and uh, another uh, key figures in the Republican movement <laughs> during page 11 during the 1970s, this book was of huge importance to him. And in fact, he kind of does talk about this book being maybe more important than many of the other books that they were reading uh, at the time. And in fact, I was talking to Jerry in the doll the other day, and he was just reminding me that this was one of the books that they weren't allowed to have in, in Cage 11, despite the fact that it was quite a liberal policy at the time. So they had to have it smuggled in, and he still has the original copy, which I think was smuggled in with a new cover and binding uh, from a book about the Spanish monarchy and the, the Spanish Civil War by a guy called Gilmore uh, that he has. And again, in some senses, for Jerry and that generation of people, not unlike Mellows and his generation, they're trying to find a way out of a particular impasse in, in the early 1970s. The civil rights movement, which I think had been the main political education for many of his uh, generation, uh, had <coughs> collapsed under the weight of unionist intransigence supported by the British government, uh, <coughs> difference from the southern uh, establishment <coughs> here. And obviously you had that descent into conflict, and that emerging generation of leaders were trying to kind of find ideas and find ways to respond effectively to the situation uh, that they were in. And I think very clearly Leo Mellows and these writings, short and all as they are, kind of spoke to some of those concerns uh, and answered some of the questions that Jerry and others uh, were looking uh, to address. And you can see that because when Jerry and them come out of jail, <clears throat> when they take over the leadership of the party, uh, and when you see what they did with the party in the 1980s, many of the, the fingerprints of Liam Mello's blueprint are very clear. Talk about progressive alliances and building alliances with Labour and uh, uh, working class communities, trying to revise that need for a radical social and economic policy uh, is something that features very, very strongly throughout that entire period uh, in Ardesh, etc. But also that idea about the Republic being much more than just political change. That what the Republic means is that idea that when we talk about an Ireland of equals, socio-economic change, a, a, a fundamental uh, restructuring of the way in which uh, uh, things uh, work. At the same time, what Meadows is offering is something actually very thin. And again, I go back to the fact that it's only a few hundred words long. As an ideology, as a, as a program, I suppose, it is very thin, especially when you compare it with Conley or, or others. But also, uh, it, it contains some other tensions. So, for example, when Mellows talks about uh, uh, an alliance uh, with uh, the men of no property, is that Republicans becoming part of that working class movement, part of that uh, uh, movement of ordinary people uh, on an equal basis? Or is it more of a tactical alliance? That we have our project here, and we need to convince these people uh, by certain policy formulations to come over and support us. Something maybe a little bit more utilitarian or a little bit uh, uh, different. Likewise, when Mello says, <coughs> in relation to the pro programme, this doesn't require us to change our outlook, he's kind of ignoring the fact that the democratic programme never had widespread support within the broad Republican movement. Whether we like to admit it or not, despite the fact that it's one of the most important documents. Uh, I think it's Sean O'Fuelon who has uh, that very famous quote about it having been adopted and then immediately uh, uh, dismissed and ignored uh, by Republicans for long periods of time uh, afterwards. And, and I suppose this goes back to my point about Desmond Greaves, is that there is that sense in Mello's writings that even though they're talking about an alliance with Labour, an alliance with uh, uh, working class people, and even though they're adopting radical policies, there still is that kind of stagist approach that you do the national revolution first, and then you start looking after uh, the social uh, and economic well-being uh, of the citizens of, of the state. And uh, um, McHalpany, uh, I thought, very uh, appropriately asked a question at a re recent United Ireland conference, if anybody was at that conference that we had in the uh, mansion house, when he was saying, you know, in our debates now, and well, he didn't mention Mellows or he didn't mention the period of the 70s, clearly he was referring to those, you know, was Labour going to have to wait again? Uh, or was there going to be uh, some uh, change in that? And I think these three issues, that issue of, of the nature of the alliances that we're seeking to build, whether they're genuine alliances or more utilitarian alliances, 
that issue of, of the nature of our, our political program uh, and the sequencing of it. You know, Sinn Féin party constitution talks about the primary objective of the parties united Ireland and the ultimate objective of being a democratic socialist republic. And I often wonder, and I suppose this is why I started off by saying I'm in two minds about Belarus. I often wonder, can you actually achieve a united Ireland without convincing people on the way, not just by your words or promises, by the actual policies that you implement, that the type of Ireland we're talking about is different. Not a promise of something being different in the future, but actually different now, whether on councils or in the assembly or in Edsta House. So rather than seeing these as two stages, the national revolution and the social economic revolution, one coming after the other, are these not two things that should be integrated at all stages? So while we're on the way to Irish reunification, we are building that Ireland of equals that democratic socialist republic, which of course is an ongoing task after that. And I think those kind of tensions are part of the reason why, up until quite recently, our project hasn't been as successful as I think it now is. Because whether we realise it or not, I argue, and maybe I'm wrong, that we have started to depart a little bit from what Mellows was proposing in his jail notes. And we're starting to kind of find new ways to tackle some of those problems in ways that are proving much more successful for us. So just to conclude then, I suppose for me these are some of the big abstract questions for us at the moment, but they're directly related to uh, the work we do on a day-to-day -day basis, but also some of the choices we're going to have to make in the coming uh, period of time if, if we're going to grow the struggle. And that first one goes back to the Progressive Alliance. Whether the Progressive Alliance is a real alliance where we want to be partners with other people, or whether it's an alliance to uh, uh, garner support from other people to our pre-existing project. And, you know, you can think of some of the issues around the right to water, the right to change, our alliances with other political and trade union forces, and how we think about those. The second thing is this issue of the integration of what I call the national and the social, the United Ireland and the Ireland of Equals. And how, to what extent are we able to integrate those in, in word and indeed in a way that brings more people over to our project uh, in, in constituencies uh, across the country. And the third is the radical program. Um, and it's all very well having a radical program, but if we look at what's happened in other parts of the world, uh, it, even when you have governments that have huge social mo movements behind them, that have uh, uh, majorities in government, there are huge restrictions on what you're uh, able to do, whether placed on you by the European Union, uh, or indeed uh, placed on you by domestic forces. <coughs> to what extent do we really understand that and are we prepared uh, and ready uh, for tackling those things uh, when we get into power? And the last is, to repeat the point, will Labour have to wait again? One of the big questions we're going to have to decide uh, as a party is not only when we go into government, but with who and on what terms. Uh, and when we do that, what issues uh, are we willing to compromise on? Do we think in advance uh, on the uh, issue of partition and border referendum and all our reunification could be made, but would we have to uh, uh, concede on some key socioeconomic uh, grounds? Uh, or indeed, uh, is it even possible to think of entering into a coalition government on whatever terms in a way that allows you to seriously challenge the social economic status quo and all of the problems uh, that come with it? So just to conclude, I think Liam Mellows is a figure of huge importance for us. But I also think some of the things that he didn't have the time to grapple with because of his uh, short life and the fact that he was executed and didn't have the time, as Jerry rightly points out, to spend more time writing and thinking and debating, has meant we've inherited some of those difficulties. And I do think there's a value, even if it seems sometimes a little bit abstract, talking these things through and teasing them out and seeing, are there ways of resolving those tensions now that allow us then in our practical day-to-day -day work as, as Republican activists to overcome some of the difficulties, not only for Mellows at this time, but pretty much every subsequent generation of left Republicans up until the 21st century. And I think this is precisely the kind of place we should be having those discussions. And I'm delighted that Joe and others invited me to at least share some thoughts at the start of this. Thank you very much.